Hello. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, thank you all for coming here today. Um, I'd like to take this moment to just thank all of you. I know we were pushing for this to happen for a while, so I'm glad that there's a good turnout. Um, so we're gathered here today um, in remembrance of the lives of transgender individuals that are lost at the hands of senseless violence. And we put this chapel together to honor the precious lives of our transgender brothers and sisters. And it is our hope that you all live here today with a newfound understanding and compassion for all who are subjected to violence on the basis of their identities. I'd like to welcome today our guest speaker, Jenna Rayanne Martin. Um, Jenna is a Goshen College alum who lives in Goshen, in Goshen not Goshen College. <laughs> um, she was an active participant at Assembly Mennonite Church for many years where she received, she recently gave a sermon about her experience living in the closet and her fear of organized Christianity and its attitudes towards LGBTQ plus individuals. She currently attends Faith Mennonite Church where she is the liaison of the Supportive Communities Network. Um, Jenna is a musician. She's an active member of the Goshen political scene a home construction worker, and an aspiring teacher. Please join me in welcoming her up to share a few words. Thank you, I feel welcome already. My name is Jenna Rayanne Martin, and I'm a trans woman and a Mennonite. The fact that I can safely say that out loud in a relatively public place is a blessing that I don't take for granted. 20 years ago, when I was a student here at Goshen College, even if I had known that I was trans, I don't think I would have felt safe coming out, and certainly not in a setting like this. I wouldn't have feared for my life or my physical safety, but it would have been reasonable to fear that I might have been subject to passive aggressive and dehumanizing lectures about how I was dishonoring God. Maybe I would have been discouraged from taking certain classes or joining certain clubs. Maybe I would have been encouraged to leave this institution. Over the last 15 years in the Mennonite Church and in broader society, the trans debate has been raging. Many Christian institutions try to argue that it's about morality or traditional values. That's a lie at best and a smokescreen at worst. Debating the validity of our identities is ultimately about deciding who counts as human. It's a debate about who should have the full suite of social rights and who shouldn't. Who should be allowed to walk down the street without getting catcalled? Who should have the right to use a public restroom without getting passive aggressive looks and comments thrown at them? Who should be allowed to play on sports teams? Who should be welcome to wear concert attire that fits their gender identity? Rules and legislation constraining how trans people are allowed to dress and act and participate in regular life sends a clear message that we are second class citizens and cisgender people are the correct way to be. I want to take a moment and appreciate how far we've come and how much the power has shifted over the decades. Trans people are still a minority, even in the queer community, but the very fact of anyone feeling safe enough to come out of the closet is a testament to how much more freedom we LGBTQ plus people have to believe that we are allowed to come out of hiding and start being our true selves. In Mennonite culture, our host institution, the Mennonite Church, Mennonite Church USA, finally admits that the full alphabet of LGBTQIA plus people are welcome in the church. I was invited here to, today to speak by the Goshen College Advocates, who got my name from the Brethren Mennonite Council for Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Interests. Here at GC, not only are there trans students out on campus, but you even hosted a drag show last year, which was amazing, by the way. This is certainly not the welcome that many trans and queer people have received in their home communities. The reason we're here today is because this is the Trans Day of Remembrance. On this day, we remember the countless trans people who have been murdered because they didn't have a safe place like Goshen College in order to be themselves. As of October 23rd, 2023, at least 26 transgender and gender non-conforming people have been killed in the United States, and at least 320 globally in the last year. The Human Rights Campaign uses the phrasing, at least, because these statistics are limited to people who were widely known to be trans and whose identities as trans people weren't obscured by news media deadnaming or misgendering them. 
In 2022, the most recent year for which data is available, the FBI recorded a record high number of hate crimes related to gender identity, including a 33% jump in hate crimes on the basis of gender identity from the year before. According to the Williams Institute, trans people are four times more likely than cisgender people to be victims of violent crime. On this day of remembrance, I want to delve into why this is the case, who the perpetrators and victims might be, and how you and I fit into the picture. Let me tell you a little bit about my past and what led me to being here today. I was assigned male at birth and growing up on a traditional farm family, only a little bit removed from conservative Mennonite culture, I was therefore assigned to work in the barn in the field, while the other girls in my family worked in the house and garden. The first time I remember questioning my gender, The first time I remember questioning my gender was during a school dance in middle school. This was an event where male presenting students approached female presenting students and requested to dance with them for one song. I was chatting with a friend before the event and I said, sometimes I wish I was a girl. He thought that was weird and that was my first lesson in learning to hide my identity. I felt confident enough in myself and my friends to experiment later with low-key gender bending throughout high school and college, growing my hair long and occasionally wearing nail polish and skirts. But the early lessons I learned isolated on the farm were that genitals define gender. And for me personally, I assumed that my attraction to girls at that time further proved that I was a boy. I continued to follow traditional script, getting married to a woman I met here at college and starting a family together. When we were choosing baby names, I remember feeling distinctly different about the prospect of having a boy or having a girl, as we phrased it in those days. I was afraid of having a boy because I felt like there would be more responsibility for me as the man to teach him how to properly perform the gender that I thought we shared. In retrospect, that could have been another clue as to my actual gender identity. Of course, I wouldn't want to, of course I wouldn't want to teach him to perform a gender that I wasn't excited about manifesting. But throughout all this gender bending and discomfort, it never occurred to me that I might actually be trans until a woman at my church came out as trans. As she unfolded her story to us over a span of weeks and months, I first put words to my feelings. I think I might be trans. I tried coming out to a few friends and to my wife, but they freaked out in a way that made me feel like I was a horrible spouse if I started embracing my true gender. So I made a calculated decision and went back into the closet. Spoiler alert, lying about who I was didn't make me any less trans, nor did it save my marriage. I tried to deal with my disappointment by avoiding my spouse and children, and I tried to satisfy my restricted identity by being out to myself in private and expressing plausibly deniable feminine gender markers like long hair, dangly earrings, and long cardigans. COVID was a wake-up call for me. I realized that life is finite, and statistically speaking, mine was probably half over. Was I going to live my life truthfully or die in the closet? I pushed my gender nonconformity even further and came out as non-binary at work, but it still wasn't enough. I embarked on an intensive sequence of therapies, and in January of 2022, I officially and wholeheartedly accepted in my own heart that I'm a trans woman. When I came out publicly a few months later, my spouse was much more open-minded than she had been before but there was so much baggage and damage to our relationship by that point that we mutually decided to divorce. I spent a lot of time in the next year embracing my trans identity and finding beautiful connection and acceptance in the queer community. Life was stressful and my brain frantically worked to rewire itself to accommodate my new reality of being a single woman. But the incredible freedom to be unreservedly myself held me floating on a cloud and randomly breaking into smiles of pure joy. I discovered I have smiling dimples. I never knew. Since graduating from college, I'd been an active participant at Assembly Mennonite Church, quietly watch, watching them wrestle with the gay issue. As a closeted participant at Assembly, I'd never felt comfortable joining the church as a member. There was just too much religious trauma lodged deep inside me. The Mennonite Church, from my childhood had instilled in me a deep belief that being gay was a sin and that being trans was contrary to God's plan for my life. And despite the societal progress, assembly still hadn't proved to me 
and I hadn't processed my trauma rigorously enough to feel confident that they would really, truly accept me. But Assembly had been gradually working on coming to terms with LGBTQ plus identities, and by the time I got my life in order enough to come out as trans, they accepted me without reservation. To my surprise, when I came out publicly as trans, I suddenly felt much better about the prospect of joining the church. But everything in my life seemed to be open to reconsideration at that point, and I found a fresh spiritual start at Faith Mennonite Church, where I currently attend. So why have you invited me to speak? I'm guessing it's because I'm a graduate of this college who has been deeply involved in Mennonite culture for my entire life, and yet somehow managed to keep and even deepen my church connection throughout the turmoil of coming out as trans. I told the Convo search committee that I'm a trans person and that I'm a Mennonite, and they assumed, rightly, that with those credentials for a speech, for a speech on Trans Day of Remembrance, that you might listen to what I have to say. One statistic I didn't mention earlier is that 80% of trans murder victims this year were people of color. The search committee didn't ask me what my color skin is, but it's white, obviously. Just to muddy the waters, many people are also surprised to find that I'm an immigrant, which I'm guessing some of you might be too. But please don't think for a second that I understand what it's like to be a racial minority. All I can say is that being an immigrant is one more thing that might help me understand what it's like to be part of an oppressed minority. Similarly, even though I'm a woman, I spent 42 years being treated with male privilege. I've barely scratched the surface of understanding gender discrimination. Furthermore, because the Goshen community and the country as a whole have made so much progress in LGBTQ plus acceptance while I was hiding in the closet, I've never experienced any overt danger or discrimination due to my minority statuses. So when I spelt the statistic that 54% of trans murder victims in 2023 have been black trans women, I can maybe say that I only under really understand a quarter of that. Everything and anything I say about race or gender in this speech, please, please feel free to fact check and explore more in depth. I was hoping I could add some multimedia elements to my speech today, but I didn't have the capacity to do this. Why? A few other things about me. I'm a divorcee. I'm a single mom of two. I didn't have time to create a fancy presentation because I have to work full time. I have to drive both kids to school because the bus won't pick them up at two different houses. At the moment I was originally writing this paragraph, I should have been making my children's lunches. With one income, I can barely afford a house with bedrooms for my kids. I'm overwhelmed, I don't have a computer, I don't have the spoons to find or borrow one or ask for someone for help from a tech person at the college. When many people are in tough situations, family is able to step in and help. My extended family has experienced gender discrimination, estrangement among members, abuse, forced closeting, violence, and even murder. The emotional and financial capacity of my family is strained. They're doing all they can already. I'm not trying to say this to gain sympathy points. I'm doing okay in spite of all these strikes against me, but I'm revealing possible connections between myself and other trans people. When I was at Goshen College 20 years ago, the student body was over 80% white and close to 60% Mennonite. That's changed a lot, although white is still the largest group. Quick poll, raise your hand if you're white. That's a lot. Uh, raise your hand if you're an American citizen. Also a lot. If you were assigned male at birth and you're happy with that, raise your hand. Okay. And who has English as their native language? Yeah. So, we have a lot of privileged identities. And this next section is for everyone who just raised their hand. Never forget that we are members of the most privileged group of people in the history of the world. That means that we are constantly going to struggle to understand and appreciate what it's like to go through life as an oppressed minority. Ironically and perversely, our privilege also means that we are in one of the best positions to affect change in our society. When we say that racism and sexism and transphobia are a problem, people will listen because they will intrinsically believe and assume that we are on their side, just like you're all listening to me and you invited me here because I'm a Mennonite and a fluent English speaker. 
Most of you, not as many as I expected, in this audience are also students. People who are blessed with intelligence or financial resources or both to attend a private college. When you get out into the real world, people will assume that you deserve more money and more respect because you have this degree. I know because I have it too. See, we're the same, trust me. I've experienced this firsthand in, in multiple job interviews. Oh, you have a college degree? Let me sit up a little straighter and respectfully ask you how much money you think you deserve. Um, okay, great, thanks, I guess. Privilege is real. Recognize it and use your power to make the world a better place. Those of you who are not white or not American citizens or not native English speakers, I understand that your lives are more difficult. Every ounce of emotional energy you use to hold back an angry comment and racism is aimed at you, every extra form you have to fill out because you're not automatically granted the same rights as citizens, every brain cell that you dedicate to the task of communicating in a second language, all of those are resources that you don't have to spend on fighting for trans equality. I accept that that limits your capacity, but let me make a request. Would you be willing to use your experience as minorities to try to build and communicate empathy for the cause of LGBTQ plus rights. You have a depth of understanding that your white American native English speaking classmates don't have. If you're overwhelmed with your own struggles, I release you from this request. But if you have the capacity, we queers would dearly appreciate your allyship. I asked some current students about the attitudes of GC students when it came to gender and sexuality. They said there's a broad range of opinions, but that the college population as a whole are mostly liberal, citing the example of openly gay staff, including past and present campus pastors. But they also said that there's a significant minority of students who would rather hide from the issues. I asked if those students were likely to attend this convo, even if they would rather avoid it. And they said, yeah, they might, because this late in the semester, they might have attendance quotas to fill. So if that's you, this part is for you. I chose to attend Goshen College because I thought I was insulating myself safely in an echo chamber of like-minded people who would support the conservative Christian worldview I grew up with. I believed that if I attended this Christian college, I would be safe from modern evil influences like homosexuality. But you know what I discovered? I was wrong. First of all, so-called sinful lifestyles are not actually sinful. Secondly, LGBTQ plus identities are centuries old and span numerous cultures across the world. Before I knew I was trans, I did a lot of avoiding interaction with advocates of LGBTQ plus rights. I now believe that was a mistake. We know what we know about gender and sexuality. We can't ignore it, and we can't go backwards. You know who tried to literally erase trans people? The Nazis. Those books they burned, in those famous pictures included a bunch of research on medical interventions for trans people. Research Magnus Hirschfeld and the Institute of Sexual Research in Berlin to find out more about that. The Nazis lost the war. You can bury your head in the sand if, like I did for many years, or you can face the reality around you. We are here and we are queer. I wanted to write a whole section of this speech talking about the perpetrators of trans murders. I thought, if we observe trends about who exactly is killing trans people, maybe we can find a way to mitigate the problem. I'm not a research scientist or a journalist, but I wasn't able to find much. The only meaningful statistic I found was that somewhere between 16 and 25% of perpetrators are intimate partners of the victim, either in casual sexual encounters or in established relationships. So let's use our imaginations and think about who might feel motivated and have the means and opportunity to kill a trans person. When I worked in education, we studied bullying. I was fascinated to learn that enacting physical violence against someone is a far broader and more socially complex phenomenon than simply person A hurts person B. For every person who directly bullies, there are four levels of participants who contribute to or enable the violence. Supporting the primary bully are followers, those who take an active part in the bullying but don't plan or instigate it. Around the followers are the supporters, these people may cheer on the violence or even simply show interest in what is happening, and bullies love an audience. Beyond the supporters are the disengaged onlookers. These people don't directly participate in any way, but they're aware of the violence 
and they believe it's not their problem. Below this are possible defenders. These people have the opportunity to do something, and they know they should do something, but they fail to act. For every instance of a trans person being beaten or raped or killed, there are innumerable other instances of someone considered, who someone considers acting against trans people. And for every instance of that, there are people making laws discriminating against trans people and pushing us towards second-class citizenship. For every instance of discriminatory laws, there are people voting for these politicians. And for every instance of voting for prejudiced politicians, there are people sitting passively by while others do this foundational work upon which violence is built. Raise your hand if you've ever heard this famous quote. If you're neutral in situations of injustice, you've chosen the side of the oppressor. Yeah. This was said by South African freedom fighter Desmond Tutu. Or how about this one? First they came for the socialists, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, and I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. These words were written by Martin Niemöller, a Lutheran pastor in Nazi Germany, after he survived eight years in Nazi prisons and concentration camps. Disengaged, neutral, possible defender is the zone I most often find myself inhabiting. And I'm guessing a lot of you have that in common with me. I read about violence against trans people. I see news about genocide in Israel-Palestine. But do I do anything? Not really. I'm too busy. It's not on my doorstep. My life is hard enough without taking on other people's burdens. I despise this complacency in myself. I want to be able to fix things, but I just feel too overwhelmed. Defending people who are being harmed is hard work and is dangerous. It takes time and it takes physical, social, and emotional energy. Let's get back to our thought experiment. If we and most of our social circles are somewhere on the side of disengaged onlookers thinking something should be done, who might we know who is a supporter of actual violence against trans people? There's another sociological concept called the pyramid of hate. It also has five levels, the most extreme of which is genocide, the act or intent to systematically annihilate an entire people. Pretty sure that doesn't really involve any of us. But below that is biased related violence, including murder, rape, assault, vandalism, and threats. Story time. I wrote this next section about two weeks ago while sitting in my living room in my house in Goshen. I'm sitting here not doing research to find stories of trans people who are murdered. I'm procrastinating because I'm in shock. I'm exhausted from emotional turmoil because I was a victim of a hate crime last night. Not against my body, thank goodness, but against my house. For a few weeks now, I've been flying an American pride flag. It's like an American flag, but the stripes are all rainbow. I hesitated to fly this flag because of the way that the American flag has been used in this country and how it's so strongly associated with white supremacy. But I just became an American citizen because I believe this country can be more than a stronghold of white supremacy. I believe in liberty and justice for all. The United States of America is my country now, and I'm a trans woman, and I have just as much right to be here as cisgender people and straight people and people who boast that their ancestors have lived in this city for four generations. And I thought, if blue lives matter and red lives matter can co-opt the American flag and make it a symbol of their political ideology, we can do the same to show that queer lives matter. Last night, someone tore my flag down from where it was hanging. This was the second time it had happened. But this time, instead of making it disappear, they cut it jaggedly in half and crumpled it up on my doorstep. Not only trespassing, not only vandalism, but a targeted hate crime against my clear expression of welcome to anyone who might feel part of this beautiful rainbow that is the American queer community. It's easy to read or hear about this act of vandalism, but it's hard to experience the emotions that come with being violated in this way. Knowing that someone in my own neighborhood hates me or feels so threatened by me that they need to assert physical violence against me is deeply fear-inducing and disconcerting. My emotions were all over the map. Will they come again? Do they know my children live here? 
Do they know my name? Are they targeting me specifically or just queer allyship in general? Will they escalate the violations? Do the police have my back? Do my neighbors have my back? I believe I'm lucky, but I may have to backpedal on my earlier statement that I've not experienced any transphobia in my chosen home city of Goshen. Here's another story. I recently started getting into the dating scene, and so I downloaded some of the apps. The other day I saw someone had written on their dating profile, if you trans or some shit, don't message me or you're gonna get smoked. I don't know exactly what smoked means, but I'm pretty sure it's not something I want to experience. In this case, in this instance, I had the power to swipe left, but it's scary knowing that there are people out there who feel powerful enough to threaten trans people that they haven't even met. So, vandalism and threats, level two on the pyramid of hate. The next level down is discrimination. This might be economic, political, employment, and housing discrimination or segregation. When I came out as trans and got divorced a few years ago, I was an established member of the Goshen community and a longtime participant in one of the most progressive and LGBTQ plus affirming Christian churches in the city. I parted from my spouse on very good terms and had multiple job opportunities available. In other words, I had a very strong foundation of stability in terms of relationships and social and economic safety net. I'm incredibly lucky, but I also had the patience and ability to make a calculated journey of coming out. I was able to build on a strong foundation under the guise of being a white male. I'm not saying I did this intentionally and it certainly wasn't trying to fool anyone or take advantage. But the whole time I was here gaining my college education and immigrating to this country, marrying into a family that was slightly richer than mine, buying my first and second houses, applying for loans, joining the church, and applying for six different jobs over the last 20 years, I did so with the help of white cis male privilege. There was never any question that people would welcome me as a student, as a legal permanent resident, as a spouse, as a loan holder, as a participant in my congregation, or as an employee. I was a shoe in operating as one of the most privileged elite in a culture literally built from the ground up to favor my apparent demographic. Just imagine if any of my demographic parameters had been different. I don't need to tell you all that women, people of color, and genderqueer people are not treated equally in this society. Next down on the pyramid of hate are dehumanization, slurs, ridicule, acts of avoidance, and belittling jokes. For every formal structure of discrimination, there are countless acts of bias bolstering others' freedom to discriminate. Remember the bullying supporters? They aren't laying hands on anyone, but they're contributing to the culture of bias, making it okay to do the hands-on bullying. On an institutional level, for every instance of someone threatening trans people in their dating profile or destroying a pride flag, there are countless jokes ridiculing trans people and making perpetrators feel justified in doing their harm. I hope I've been speaking hypothetically up to this point and that none of you find yourselves or your friends perpetrating acts of bias. But don't worry, there's one more level where we can still find ourselves in the pyramid of hate. That is, biased attitudes. Oh, come on, Jenna, let us off the hook. No, I won't, because I'm in that category with you. So, let's solve this problem. Biased attitudes manifest as insensitive remarks, stereotyping, fear of differences, non-inclusive language, microaggressions, justifying biases with like-minded people, and isolating yourself from receiving positive information. Raise your hand if you've ever found yourself in one of these categories. Thank you for being honest. I certainly have. I've made insensitive remarks about how much people in my family eat. I have stereotyped that anyone who, carry, who owns a gun hates gay people. I have avoided socializing with people from different cultures because it's too much work to communicate. I've whined about why do black people all have that accent? And it took me way too long to agree that we probably shouldn't give any more money to a certain wizard-themed media empire founded by a trans-exclusionary radical feminist. You see those purple hymnals in front of you? My friend Adam Tice did a ton of work editing the texts to be more inclusive. But I've heard people, even in my very progressive church, complain about the changes. And when the blue hymnal came out 30 years ago, I was one of the people complaining about the changes. 
I'd like to think that I'm enlightened now and all the biased attitudes have stopped with my generation, but I had to caution my 14-year-old son the other day because he kept making jokes demeaning short people. He's growing like a weed, and I get that he's trying to come to terms with his changing height, and he's looking for validation that his body is still a good and beautiful vessel. But doing so by suggesting that short people are in some way inferior is a dangerous attitude. Biased attitudes are insidious and hard to change. That will always be true. So who are the perpetrators of violence against trans people? Well, it's kind of all of, all of us. The more important question is, where are we on the pyramid of hate? The first step to solving this problem is knowing exactly how we are contributing to it. After that, we can start figuring out what we do to change things for the better in our own lives and the lives of people we're connected to. We've established that most of us in some way have responsibility to make changes in ourselves. And I already mentioned that the majority of trans murder victims are blacks, black women, but let's humanize those statistics a little bit. Lisa Love, a 35-year-old black transgender woman, was fatally shot on October 17th, 2023, while walking home from a friend's house. She was described by a friend as funny, smart, beautiful, and a breath of fresh air to this world. Lisa's cousin remembered her as an all-around good person who did not deserve this, a loving, caring, free-spirited person, always smiling and laughing. A little closer to Goshen, in Gary, Indiana, Dominic Dupre was a 25-year-old black, gender non-conforming person who operated companies, uh, snow removal, lawn care. Dominic was fatally shot in uh, Chicago on October 13th, 2023. Maria Jose Rivera Rivera, a 22-year-old Latina transgender woman, was described as lively, funny, and dynamic, and a joy to work with. Tragically, she was found fatally shot in Houston, Texas on January 21st, 2023. Christian Sanchez, the supervising attorney at Races Texas, and Maria Jose's immigration lawyer, told the Human Rights Commission that all signs point to her murder being committed by an intimate partner. He provided the following statement. Maria Jose was a joy to work with. I always look forward to speaking with her. She was lively, funny, and dynamic. My heart hurts from her loss. Transgender people who are immigrants suffer two levels of oppression and marginalization from society. This makes them especially vulnerable to harm. The transgender immigrant community deserves respect and safety. Let's dig a little deeper into the racial dynamics here. Disclaimer, I grew up very isolated in a super white farming community in a different country, so I'm a little late to hearing stories about American slavery and this institutionalized racism that has grown up since then. Hopefully you all already know this, but quick recap from tanyapearson.org. After Americans finally developed the political will to decide that racist slavery was a bad thing and did something about it, a lot of people didn't like the official position of the federal government. These dissenters in local and state leadership created laws and restrictions collectively known as Jim Crow laws, which legalized racial segregation and black codes, which determined when, where, and how formerly enslaved people could work and where they could go. Even when there were laws or institutions put into place to protect black people, they were often functionally symbolic. The people in power were still all white men and could twist, manipulate, or overlook the laws however they chose without consequence. Regular white people were also able to take matters into their own hands through assaulting and lynching black people and were seldom held accountable for these crimes. Eventually, the institution of slavery was replaced with other less obvious social trends. Redlining was a way to push black people into certain neighborhoods where it was easier to discriminate against them by disrupting their communities with superhighways, policing them, and avoiding economic development in the area. Tying public school funding to property taxes helps to ensure poor quality education. Food deserts contribute to poor health. And guess what happens to language when a culture is isolated? Yep, it's gonna be different. So the answer to my racist question, why do black people sound different from me, is that it's because we have structured our entire society around making it really, really hard for black people to navigate in white-dominated space, and also really, really easy for us white people to continue to treat them like second-class citizens and avoid interacting with them. Remember all the privilege I had while building and rebuilding my life over the last 20 years? My education, marriage, immigration journey, 
financial borrowing ability and career changes all happened in the, in the absence of this kind of institutional prejudice. If we look more in depth at lists of trans murder victims, you might notice a high number of the victims are prostitutes. My purity culture upbringing means I have to fight extra hard to overcome my biased attitudes towards sex work, but I'm working on it. Janet Mock is a black trans woman who wrote an autobiography titled Redefining Realness. In it, she talks about the factors that drove her to seek work as a prostitute. In her own words, many people believe trans woman, women choose to engage in the sex trade rather than get a real job. That belief is misguided because sex work is work and it's often the only work available to marginalized women. Though we act as individuals, we can't remove ourselves from the framework of society. Systemic oppression creates circumstances that push many women to choose sex work as a means of survival. And I was one of those women choosing survival. See, systemic oppression, sound familiar? She explains the connection saying, poverty is the key factor that drives trans women of color into sex work. The sex industry is filled with women of color and so are our prisons. Race, class, and gender are all factors that frame the harshness of sentences and more likely than not, a trans woman of color arrested on solicitation will be treated as a criminal with little regard to the systemic oppression that has led her there. Our society criminalizes underground economies like sex work and deep moral biases and stigma make even the most liberal folk believe that these actions are a moral failure of the individual rather than the workings of a system. Janet was not one of the black trans women who was murdered. But take the example of Ashanti Carmen. Her trans identity was rejected by her family and she was kicked out at the age of 16. Homeless and desperate, she had little choice but to engage in sex work. Eventually, she found work outside the underground economy and engaged in sex work less often. She got engaged to her boyfriend and had found a community outside of her blood family. However, she and her fiance still struggled to find an apartment they could afford. At age 27, Carmen was found shot dead on a street in Fairmont Heights, Maryland. I'm not gonna ask who has never been a victim of rape or assault, that's too vulnerable. I'm not gonna ask how close violence has been to your family and to your life. That's for you to know. But I will tell you about my experience so that maybe you'll see more of the humanity behind these vague names in the news. Ten years ago, a member of my spouse's family was violently assaulted and another one was murdered in their own home in Goshen. It was stunning. It was impossible to believe. I still feel like my heart is in a vice. The grief and pain don't go away. Your life builds up around the horrible memories and you're left scarred forever. This trauma put a huge strain on my marriage. I had no idea how to support my grieving spouse. I was also still locked in the closet. I didn't even know how to support my own emotional turmoil, let alone help her deal with hers. And can you imagine trying to effectively parent children in the aftermath of a tragedy like this? None of the victims in our family were black or trans, so I'm not claiming that I completely understand what it's like to have your black trans sister or daughter murdered. But my empathy factor is high. With all the privilege in our white middle-class family, we were not utterly devastated. We still had the economic means and emotional spoons to go on family vacations and put the kids in swim lessons and travel to visit our extended family every Christmas. But yet, damage had been done and our lives were harder because of it. Coming out as trans has strained my relationship with my parents. I'm so overwhelmed with life right now that I'm procrastinating on doing the work necessary to repair that relationship, if it even can be repaired. Not doing that work means maybe I won't visit them at Christmas. Maybe they'll be hurt by that and be less willing to support me financially in times of need as they've done in the past. I'm not in poverty, but I understand the factors that could lead someone to that place in their life. There are multiple levels of perpetration of these crimes and there are multiple levels of victimhood. It's all part of the same problem. 
and I believe working on any related element will have a cascading effect that will help diminish the entire problem of interpersonal violence. Despite the odds stacked against me, being white means that I'm less discriminated against overall. My neighbor with multiple Confederate flags hanging in his garage and on his truck has never been anything but kind to me and was delighted to meet my equally white young daughter. But I'm pretty sure he doesn't know I'm trans, and when we were talking one day about the people who live near us, he was quick to point out that our new neighbor was a black man. It's not hard to imagine that I would not be as welcome and he would not be as friendly if I didn't have white skin. Dead naming, or using a trans person's pre-transition name, fits on the pyramid of hate under biased attitudes in the form of microaggressions and ignoring positive information. Dead naming is a profound form of disre disrespect because names have power. What if I insisted that Goshen College be called John Howard Yoder College? There's some baggage there, which if you don't know, look it up. But mostly, my insistence on using that name means nothing because I don't have power. But what if Goshen College calls a student the wrong name? The power differential is flipped. With apologies to Aiden, my name was misspelled on the poster advertising this. It's just an inkling of like how much power the institution has over the individual. The reason I flew an American pride flag at my house instead of a trans flag is that out of some measure of self-protection, I generally experience the privilege of passing as a cis woman, and I don't really care to jeopardize my safety by raising suspicion that I'm trans. If my Confederate friendly neighbor asks me about my flag, I can honestly say, I support equal rights for all Americans. It's nothing personal. So what are we gonna do about this problem? Well, I'm gonna come up here and give this speech, and uh, I'm also going to live my best life to prove that trans people are normal people deserving of all the same level of respect as the cisgender minority. I'm going to daily remind my coworkers that I'm not cisgender or straight. In doing so, I continually ally myself with other queer folks so that my coworkers don't complacently think that I'm just one of them. I'm also working to reach outside of my immediate community to connect with other queer people. I want to help them find a community where they can be safe and where they can all feel loved and supported and hopefully avoid being violated and killed. Queer poet Andrea Gibson says, if you're going to change someone's mind about something, it won't be because you're a good talker. It will be because you are a thoughtful and compassionate listener. I think I'm a good talker, but I'm working on my listening skills. When my Confederate friendly neighbor talks to me, I listen. I see him sitting out in front of his garage by himself almost every day when I get home from work. I can't imagine he's not lonely. I can show him that I care enough to wave hello and listen to his stories about fishing and hunting. And if he ever finds out I'm trans, hopefully he will remember my humanity. What about you? Showing up here is a great start, and I'm glad to see each and every one of you. You students are the future, insert cliche here. But seriously, it's true. I have like maybe 40 years left. You have 60. You have more time to make the world a better place. Not everyone can be gone to your MLK, but we all have some circle of community and some ability to influence it. Get involved in clubs that support queer people. Keep in touch with the organizations that are working on these justice issues. When David Kendall asks you for volunteers to help with, help with Goshen Pride events next summer, sign up. Pay attention and listen when people tell you about discrimination they've experienced. It's much easier to stop hate when it's lower down on the pyramid. It may not feel like it at the time, but stopping your friend from joking about trans people is a lot easier than stopping someone who already has a gun and is intent on taking out their anger at the world on a trans person. Stop hate before it grows to violent proportions. If you found yourself somewhere on the pyramid of hate or in the levels of bullying, think about how you can break this cycle in your own life. Can you find different subjects to joke about? Can you make a conscious effort to talk to someone who thinks differently than you? I feel like I've heard this ad nauseum, but seek out books and media by marginalized people. When you're in charge of tech at a chapel about Trans Day of Remembrance, don't play country music by white people right before it. One of my favorite genres to read are biographies, like the one by Janet Mock. 
If you're involved in music and theater, what about performing works by queer, black, or immigrant composers and writers? Criticize your friends when you see them being part of the problem. Years ago, the hymnal text editor I was talking about earlier used to comment constantly on my Canadian heritage. He was solidly in the realm of microaggressions and stereotyping. It was difficult, but I finally had the courage to speak up and ask him to stop, and he did. No one is perfect, but that doesn't mean you can't learn and go on to do great things. There's a vigil tonight in remembrance of trans victims. It's in the Shock Plaza at 5.30. Go! I hope I've connected to you with my personal stories and whet your appetite intellectually. Let's go to this vigil and engage our spiritual selves in solving this problem. We are blessed in this country to still have some semblance of democracy. My men and my ancestors thought they could exist separately from the society around them. But that's not how I want to live. I want to be involved and I want to actively work to make our society better for not only myself and my family and my friends, but also the people that Jesus told us are our neighbors. If you're a human, you deserve basic rights, no matter your gender, identity, or race. Rights in our society are granted and taken away in large part by people with political power. I hope that all of you who are eligible voted in the recent local election. Do you want to know who I voted for? I voted for the person who, when she found out I was a trans woman and an immigrant, invited me out for coffee and listened intently for 45 minutes while I told her my story. I voted for the person who welcomed me into my local neighborhood association leadership and who visited my church to hear me speak about my Christian journey. I voted for my fellow immigrant running for city council, and I voted for the person who overtly stated her support not only for local businesses, but also for the Hispanic population that is becoming more and more part of the Goshen community as well as the Goshen College community. Voting and changing problematic structures is of vital importance, but we need to work against bias at every level of society. The reason I shared so many specific stories about myself and other real people is to help you relate. Black American author Ta-Nehisi Coates says, if folks can't imagine you as human, all the policy in the world is irrelevant. Find the people who love you for who you are, not for who they want you to be, and support them in their efforts to make our community a better place. I know as college students, you probably don't have much money right now, but if you have some, give it to organizations who are doing this social justice work. When your friend suggests starting a club to learn about social justice cause, encourage them and join the club. Finally, when you go out into the work world, think about what your career is contributing to society. Are you enabling rich people to consume more of the world's resources? Or are you helping the poor gain access to some of those resources to fulfill their needs? We as white people don't have the right to structure the entirety of society for our benefit. But we do have most of the power still. How do we include other people, other subcultures in the way we grow our society and structure our power systems? First of all, we need to listen. What is it like being black in America? What is it like being trans in America? What is it like being an immigrant here? And as we begin to listen, we begin to see the systemic problems and the importance of addressing them. As we learn about the lives of oppressed minorities, we begin to see the humanity of all of these people that our culture has taught us to think of as less important, less worthy, and less deserving of the privileges and comforts so many of us have taken for granted. The United States didn't make strides forward in civil rights because Martin Luther King gave great speeches and was martyred. We achieved civil rights because regular people rode on buses they weren't allowed to and sat in restaurants where they weren't welcome. We made progress in civil rights because people were willing to be verbally harassed and spit on and pushed around, beaten, and physically assaulted. The reason it's called grass roots is because without the roots of the common people, the grass is just dead cellulose. You are the grassroots. You are the future. You are the new voters and the passionate, clear-eyed visionaries, slightly less tainted in your youthful in innocence by the weight of mundane adult responsibility. You are the ones with social freedom and potential to go into dy dynamic careers of activism and change the dangerous direction our culture is heading. Who wants to change the world? Who wants to be part of the solution? Who believes that they can take a small step and be a drop in the bucket that eventually fills up and floods the whole world with love and inclusivity, anti-racism work, and active belief in the God-given value of trans lives. 
Join us tonight for the Vigil of Remembrance, where we can connect with the spiritual and emotional elements of the horrible things that people have done violent acts. People have perpetrated, built on the foundation of our apathy. Let's begin to break this cycle and not let our grassroots die until the entire field that is our college, our city, our state, and our country are covered with a beautiful meadow of rich diversity and appreciation for the inherent value of each member of our culture, regardless of race, immigration status, or gender identity. Thank you so much, Jenna, again, for coming here today and for that amazing reminder that and something can always be done. So I really appreciate that. And just to reiterate again, we do have a vigil that's happening at 5.30 p.m. Um, I know a lot of us couldn't make it because of classes and work and other things like that. So if you know anyone who wasn't here today that would benefit from coming to the vigil, please please give them a reminder. It's gonna be at 5.30 p.m. at Schrock Plaza. Um, and beyond that, we also have some t um, coffee and donuts right out of these two doors. Um, so if you have time in between classes to come together and drink some coffee and eat some donuts, that'll be great. Um, other than that, thank you all for coming. Really appreciate it. Um, students, you can get your Convo credit through those doors as well. Thank you. Thank you.